inflation remains near a record high and it shows no signs of slowing. The consumer price You're index for September was up 8.2 percent compared to a year ago. Has made landfall as a category four winds of 155 miles per hour. tensions between the West and Russia. Russian nuclear-capable warplanes were spotted in the Pacific. If you don't have your wallet, there's no problem. Just scan your palm to pay. Amazon One is a payment system that has been tested at several there in Revelation chapter 13. You're going to want to bookmark that chapter and turn over to Matthew chapter 24 if you would. So we're starting a new uh, sermon series and a sermon series focusing on end times prophecy, which is, can be a confusing and complicated um, um, topic to go over, um, especially um, if you've never really looked into it before, never really studied it in the Bible. But let me just give you a series overview before we get into um, the topic this evening. Um, what this is and what this isn't is, let me just explain um, what this is. First of all, we're going to look at the timeline in the Bible on this Bible prophecy. The timeline that we're going to use is, is mostly captured in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 gives a really succinct um, timeline of end times prophecy up unto the rapture. All right, so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the timeline. The biggest mistake people make on Bible prophecy. I mean, just things that you see on the internet, you know, conspiracy theories that people have, you know, uh, mega church preachers. The biggest mistake that they make is they just see something somewhere and they just forget about the timeline of the Bible and they just say the end is upon us because of this. I mean, Gog, Gog and Magog is my favorite one. You know, there's a, there's a battle in Revelation chapter 20 called the Battle of Gog and Magog. And that area, if you look at, you know, what most people agree is that area is, is upwards into Russia somewhere. So every time something happens with Russia, like something's happening with Russia today, you'll see preachers or people, experts online saying, oh, Gog and Magog and the end is near. Well, here's the thing. The Battle of Magog, Gog and Magog happens after the millennial reign of Christ. So that's at least a thousand years away. All right. It's at least a thousand and seven years away. So we have to look at the timeline that the Bible gives us. So we're going to base all of our, um, all of our series study on the timeline of the Bible. I mean, why else did God give us this information in the Bible if we're not going to follow, you know, the timeline of the Bible? Another one is, you know, the blood moons. Like every time there's a blood moon, everyone, you know, someone writes a book about, you know, the, the, the rapture or something like that. It's like even before the rapture, folks, so many things need to happen before that. I can tell you for a fact that Jesus is not coming tomorrow because so many things have to happen before that occurs. So what we're going to do in this series, here's the methodology, okay? Here's the methodology. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the timeline of the Bible according to each of these prophecies, and then what we're going to do is we're going to reverse engineer what we see happening today in our world around us and, you know, see how we could possibly get there from where we are today. All right? What it is not, what this series is not, is predicting the second coming of Christ. Okay? Now, if I wanted to, you know, start a cult or grow a, you know, um, sell books or whatever, I mean, that's what you do, right? You predict that Jesus is coming, you know, on June 22nd of 2023. And that's what people do, right? But that's not what this is about. This is to give us a better understanding of what God has already put in front of us in the Bible. All right, are you there in Matthew chapter 24? Look at Matthew chapter 24. Let's just, let me give you an example. First of all, let's look at the timeline just real quickly of Matthew chapter 24. So in Matthew chapter 24, this is kind of repeated in Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21, but Matthew chapter 24 is kind of the best, um, most um, inclusive um, timeline of the events leading up to the rapture. Look at verse number three of Matthew chapter 24. Let me just give you an example. We're just going to kind of do a quick overview of the timeline that I'm talking about, and then we'll get into the sermon. The Bible says, And as, they sat, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? 
and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So they're asking Jesus, when are you coming back? And his response is basically Matthew 24, this great timeline of events. Look down at verse number 29. Verse number 29. Look at um, what he says here. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So this, of course, is why we think that the, trib or the, the rapture happens after the tribulation. Why do we think that? Because the Bible says it's after the tribulation. Okay, so there's going to be this great tribulation, these great events that happen. Look at verse number 31. It says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. This is the rapture. This is, this is Jesus coming back and gathering um, the saints together. And then, of course, we see in verse number 42, we see this word. We see this word, watch, therefore. In verse number 43, we see this word used twice. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched. The very last word of Mark chapter 13, which kind of repeats a lot of Matthew chapter 24, is the word, watch. So we see that there's all these events that are going to lead up to the second coming of Christ. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene, which Revelation chapter 13 um, details. The tribulation is going to happen from the Antichrist coming onto the scene. And then the Bible says there will be a great tribulation, such as has never been seen before. And then, of course, the rapture. All right, so we're going to look at the events one at a time that lead up to the rapture in this sermon series. Now, if you've heard me preach on end times prophecy before, the title of the series is called Clues and Milestones. Now, I've detailed out what clues are, are things that when we see these things happening and happening more, we should pay more attention, we should watch. Those are clues. Those are things that we might not be able to exactly put our finger on and say, yeah, that's this event in the Bible, but they're definite clues that should tune our attention in to these details and what's happening today. And then there's what I call milestones, all right? Like the Antichrist, you know, identifying who the Antichrist is and will, that will be a sermon to itself, that's going to be a definite milestone. There will be things that happen when a certain world leader comes on the scene where you know for sure that's what the Bible's talking about. That's what we would call a milestone, all right? So tonight, we're gonna look at a clue. We're gonna look at a clue tonight, and it's a clue that is in Revelation chapter 13. And let me just explain this idea of this one world government because many times you've heard people talk about Bible prophecy. I'm sure you've heard many YouTube videos and many different uh, pastors talking about a one world government. But here's the thing. The term one world government never comes up in the Bible. The, the, the phrase one world government is not found in end times prophecy in the King James Bible at all. Where it comes from is in Revelation chapter 13. This is where we get this idea of a one world government. Go back to Revelation chapter 13, and let me just give you an intro into the sermon. All that was intro to the intro. Okay, so now let's look at the intro to the sermon this evening. Look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 7. You're saying, what are you talking about, Pastor? What are you talking about? I've heard this idea of one world government. That's going to be a sign of the end times. But where it is, it's not... It's not, there's no literal phrase, one world government, in the Bible. Where it is coming from is Revelation chapter 13. And just a quick primer on the book of Revelation to give you a, a, an easier read. The book of Revelation is split into two parts. Okay, so when you read Revelation, you should go home and you should read Revelation this week, and then the next sermons will be easier for you to understand. But Revelation is cut into two parts. It's basically two parallel tellings of the same thing verse or chapter 1 through 11 and then verse or chapter 12 through chapter 22 and those fit side by side and the revelation will make so much more sense to you if you understand that so again chapters 1 through 11 and then the story kind of repeats itself chapters 12 through 22 so many times i'm going to reference revelation chapter 13 tonight but it's also described in Revelation chapter 6. So the events in Revelation 13 
also are taking place and we get more detail in Revelation chapter 6. This is very similar to the methodology of the Gospels. So the Gospels will have many parallel stories, but what you will get in the Gospels is you will get a different viewpoint of the same event. So it's very helpful um, that the Bible is put together that way, that God has put his word together that way for us. So we're going to be re referencing Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 6 tonight, but they're talking about the same events. All right, one world government. Where does this idea come from? Where does this idea of a one world government come from? Why is everybody so worried when they see certain things happening today that we're heading towards a one world government? This is the end times and all this. Where is it coming from? It's coming from Revelation chapter 13. Look down at verse number 7. So we see in Revelation chapter 13, it's a lot of how the Antichrist, there's actually two beasts and a dragon. Okay, it's not just the beast. There's two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. This isn't a sermon on the Antichrist. We'll get there. But there's two beasts. One beast is the Antichrist himself. The second beast is known as the false prophet, who's the mouthpiece of the Antichrist. And then, of course, the dragon is Satan who's controlling the whole thing. Okay, so there's three players there in Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse number 7, though. The Bible says, And it was given to him to make war with the saints. By the way, the saints, that's you. Okay, the saints, these aren't the Catholic saints. Okay, the saints are the saved. The saints are the people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, they are the only ones that are not going to be fooled by this man coming on the scenes. Because hopefully the saints, the, the saved people, hopefully saved people have someone that's explaining these things from the Bible to them. Okay, but look at verse um, number seven. It's, it's given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this man at this point in verse number seven had power over all the world. Okay, well now look at verse number 16. Look at verse number 16. So at verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 13, there is a one world power. He is in power over all nations at this point. Okay, look at verse number 16. And he causeth all, this is the, the first beast, the Antichrist, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is, of course, the mark of the beast that everybody talks about. But look at verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So notice verse 16 where it says he causes all. So this is, again, showing this power over all kindreds, all nations, all tongues. Complete power. Economic power. Military power. This man, at this, at this point, there is a global control structure at this point in Revelation chapter 13, okay? But look, now what we're going to do is we're going to work the problem backwards because we know at Revelation chapter 13 in verse number 7, verse number 16, verse number 17, that at that point, the Antichrist has complete power at that point. What would it take for a person to have a global control system, to have global power over all nations, all kindreds, and all tongues from where we are today? Okay, that's the point of this series. Let's work the problem backwards. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to look, we're going to look at the idea of globalism this, this evening. We're going to look at this idea of globalism. So what would need to occur for this to be possible, first of all? First of all, the Antichrist would have to be there. He would be, have to be on the scene. Okay, we know that this man who's going to be in charge of all this would have to be on the scene. That's the first thing that we don't see today that we would have to see for this to be possible in Revelation chapter 13. Now look, that's a separate sermon in itself, so we're going we're to put that one in, in, on the shelf um, for this evening. And that, that, by the way, will be a milestone. Okay, so if you're all stressed out about, you know, the one world government tonight, I'm going to make you feel a little bit better because this milestone has to be completed before the one world government happens. As a matter of fact, a lot of very bad things will have happened by the time Revelation chapter 13 um, takes place. Okay? So, but the second thing is this. Not only does there have to be this antichrist on the scene, which is a milestone sermon in itself, but there needs to be a worldwide alliance. There needs to be a worldwide alliance that this man, this antichrist, is in charge of. Okay? Do we have that today? No, 
We do not. There also needs to be, if you look at verse 16 and verse 17, with the mark of the beast, it says that no man can, might buy or sell except that he have the mark. There also needs to be a worldwide financial system. There needs to be a worldwide system where that could be made possible. Where if you didn't have something that this government wanted you to have, they could literally make it so you could not buy or you could not sell. Well, you say, well, yeah, well, this is the point of this series. Because we're going to look at what it takes to get to these points. All right, so the title of the sermon this evening is Clues and Milestones, Globalism. We don't see a worldwide government today, but what we do see, what we do see is this push today for globalism. What, what, do, what do I mean by globalism? I mean global systems. I mean global alliances. I mean global cultures. I mean global government, global rule. You know, just this idea of Globalism. We can definitely see things moving in this direction. There are forces pushing things in this direction. This is a clue. This is a definite clue. So first of all, what I want to show you this evening is this idea of globalism that we see happening today. What I want to show you first this evening, let's do a Bible study on is this what God wants? Does God want nations coming together? Does God want nations forming these massive, does God want a one world government? Does want, is that what he wants of men on this earth? Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. We see alliances today, but guess what? We saw alliances in the Bible too. Let's just do a Bible study on the nation of Israel and let's see what God wants uh, versus this, I, I'm, you know, on this idea of globalism versus what you would call nationalism. Because I guess that's the, that's the opposite of globalism. The opposite of globalism is this, this bad word that you hear today of nationalism, which is basically every nation doing what's best in their own interest and operating as a separate individual nation. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 18 is the story of Jehoshaphat, who is the, the king of Judah, the lower kingdom of Judah. And then you have this wicked king, Ahab, who is a king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the interesting thing about this story is that Jehoshaphat, he did right. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He is talked about in the Bible as one of the best kings as it, as, as it pertains to following the Lord, loving the Lord, and he was just, he was a great king, except for this one blight on his record. During the reign of Jehoshaphat, and it had Many generational consequences, what he did here, which I won't get into. Um, I've studied that um, in the past. There's sermons out there on that. But he had this one blight on his record that while he reigned in the lower kingdom of Judah and he was following the Lord, there was a wicked king named Ahab who was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, the, the kingdom split after Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Um, the kingdom split into the northern kingdom and the lower kingdom of Judah. Now, Ahab was one of the most wicked kings that he just, he just turned on the Lord. He was, he was a wicked king. He was married to an even he, a, a horrible, horrible, murderous lady. And he was a very, very bad king. But look at verse number one of 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Just to lay the groundwork. So you have a very good king following the Lord, and you have this wicked king, Ahab. Now, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and joined affinity with Ahab. That means he joined an alliance with Ahab. He joined an alliance with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab, to Samaria, and Ahab killed him sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, the king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people are as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So a couple of things I want to point out here. A couple of things I want to point out here. First of all, you have Jehoshaphat, who was a good king. He joined an alliance with Ahab. The first thing I want to point out is, what is the first thing that happens after this alliance is formed? This alliance is formed, and the first thing that happens is war. And that's really what you need to understand and really the pattern that I'm going to be driving home this evening is that 
These alliances, they, they start war. That's what they do. So this alliance with Ahab, right away, Ahab comes to Jehoshaphat and he says, hey, I'm going to go. I mean, he's fighting the Syrian army. And Jehoshaphat had no problem with the Syrian army. He didn't want to go to war with the Syrian army. But just because Ahab drew him into this, it was, it's literally the definition of an entangling alliance right here. So he ends up going to war with this wicked king against, and I'm not saying that the Syrians were good guys, and, but here's another thing you need to realize. There may be many situations when nations go to war with nations where they're good guys. As Americans, we tend to have this idea that there needs to be white hats and black hats. You know, the, that there's the good guys and the bad guys. You have to understand, especially today, not to rabbit trail, but there just may not be a situation where there's good guys. All right, so look, he gets Jehoshaphat, just to sum up the story, he goes to war with Ahab. Jehoshaphat almost dies. He almost gets killed. Ahab does get killed. Ahab gets killed. Jehoshaphat almost gets killed. Now look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19, just one verse over, and we, we hear what God has to say about what Jehoshaphat did. Look at verse number 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 19. The Bible says in Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah returned to his house in peace in Jerusalem. He barely made it out of there. He almost died. He, God had to step in, and literally, if you read about the battle, God had to literally stop the people that were attacking Jehoshaphat and save him himself. And Jehoshaphat barely makes it out with his life, and he comes home. But look at what the Bible says in verse 2. It says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. This is God's prophet. And said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Talking about Ahab. Therefore, now notice this. This prophet goes up to Jehoshaphat and says, Why are you helping This is a sermon in itself right here. There's people that hate God. We met them today out soul winning. There's people that hate God. that see somebody with a Bible preaching, and they hate you just for that. They exist today. But look what Jehu the prophet says to Jehoshaphat. He said, why are you helping these people? Why are you helping people that hate God? Therefore, you know, you're lucky you're alive. No, look what he says. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. God, God's wrath was upon Jehoshaphat for helping people that hated him. Okay, so look, it was, it was never something that God wants. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. God never wanted his nation to entangle themselves with alliances with any other nation, ever. He wanted his nation always to be an independent nation. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 1. I could read dozens and dozens of verses on this, but look at just Deuteronomy 7 verse number 1, talking about before the nation of Israel went into the promised land. It says, when the Lord thy God, verse number 1, shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. So it begs the question, if they were to, supposed to wipe these people out, why did God even continue this verse? Why did God even continue giving them direction? Because why would he have to say, don't do these things I'm about to exist because they would be utterly gone. They would be, they would be off the face of the earth because God knew that they wouldn't listen to him. God knew that they wouldn't utterly destroy all of these nations, so he gives further warning. He gives further warning. Look what he says. He says, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. He says, do not make deals with them. Do not make alliances with them. Do not make treaties with them. Do not make tax breaks, whatever, with them. But what did they do? What did they do? They went in and they started making covenants and deals with these nations. Then he, look what he says in verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt thou not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why? Why? Is God, you know, everyone would say, oh, is God racist? First of all, there's one race, the human race. That's it. All right, we're all one blood, the Bible says. 
But look what, this is why he says that they were supposed to do it. Look at verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that he may serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Look, here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. God wants nations to be independent. You say, well, this is the, the nation of Israel. They were following God, and God was looking after his own people. True. Agree. You can't really say that our nation, or really any nation on the planet right now, is really, you know, following the Lord is really God's nation. You can't really say that about any nation today. But still, God's philosophy, let's, let's study God, the philosophy of God on independence of, of nations but here's another example. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. The same philosophy that God has towards nations applies to churches. Did you know that? Churches as well are supposed to be independent. Why? For the same reason. For the same reason. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse uh, number 17. The same is found in Ephesians 5 and some other places in the Bible. We'll just look at Colossians chapter 1. God also wants... He not only wants nations to be independent, he wants churches. The same philosophy applies to churches. He wants his nation to be independent. He wants his churches to be independent. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Speaking of Jesus. We, we study this as Jesus, as the word of God, the creator. The, wor the world was spoken into existence. But look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence? So the way it works with a biblical church is this. We're, we're an independent, fundamental, King James Baptist church. This is, I mean, the word independent means we are a part of no denomination. We are not part of any denomination. It's funny when you, when you read um, news articles or things describing the uh, independent fundamental Baptist movement, they'll, they'll say like the IFB is a denomination. It is not. The, IF, the independent fundamental Baptist church has never been and never will be a denomination. It is not a denomination. They are independent churches. They are independent churches. Look, you say, what's the big deal if there's denominations? Here, here's the big deal, folks. If, if God wanted denominations, first of all, in Colossians chapter 1, five other places in the Bible here's the hierarchy the church Jesus Christ that's it I mean as far as as far as the church goes there's no middleman there there's no um, denomination president there's no um, organization over you know ten churches or anything like that denominations are completely unbiblical you say well what's the big deal it's just getting people on the same doctrine well if it, if it works so well, why is every single denomination corrupt? Every single... I can't, I can't think of a single denomination that has the correct gospel. I mean, are you kidding me? You say, why is that? Well, here's why. Denominations make it easy for Satan to corrupt the church. Why? Because instead of corrupting 50 churches, he just has to corrupt one president, one CEO, one council or whatever you want to call it and he can destroy 50 churches with the independence of churches look i'm not saying that an independent church won't go bad i'm not saying that there's not a bad pastor that will pop up somewhere that will start preaching false doctrine or a false gospel or whatever but look at least in that case it's just that church that has gone bad this is why it's designed this way because every other pastor of every other Bible-based independent church is focused on Christ. And some, some you know, lunatic or false prophet goes off the rails. I'm, I'm still focused on Christ here. I'm still focused on Christ, which is the Word of God here. I can't be corrupted by some other pastor flying off the rails and going into false doctrine or whatever. Right? This is why it is designed this way. You say, well, you, you have a lot of friends who are pastors. Yeah, but we're just friends. We're just friends. Pastor Jimenez has an independent church. It, it's funny, when I became a Baptist, when I became a Baptist after the first year or two um, at the Baptist church in North Dakota, I, I started getting asked to preach some sermons. And here's the funny thing about 
Baptist, independent Baptist churches. Pastor, when, when Pastor Jimenez comes here or when I go there, not one time has he ever asked me, what are you going to preach about? Not one time have I ever asked him before he comes here or Pastor Mejia when he comes here, what are you going to preach about? Not one time. Because I just know that his boss is Jesus and that's good enough for me. Otherwise, I, I, wouldn't, be friends, I wouldn't be friends with him. I wouldn't be friends with them if I didn't know that they knew that their boss was the same word of God, the same Jesus as I believe in. So there's no denomination. It's just, it's just friends who have the same authority, which is Jesus Christ. You know, but I never have to ask what's being preached. I never have to be told what to preach because our boss is the same person. So whenever they preach something, whenever Pastor Mejia stands up here and preaches something, I agree with it. Whenever Pastor Jimenez preaches something, I agree with it. Whenever I preach something there, they, it's, the same, it's the same boss. That's why. It's, I mean, that would be an amazing accident. The problem is, or the, the reason that it works that way is because we all have the same head, with the, which is Jesus. But churches are to be independent. Denominations, no good. It's just like alliances with nations. It goes bad quickly. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So we see nations are to be independent. Churches are to be independent. Guess what? You. The God, God wants you separated from the world as well. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. The Bible says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Up in verse 14 it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? This is what Jehoshaphat did. He took his light and, and made communion with darkness. How did that work out well for him? It was, it, it, it was a disaster. It almost cost him his life, and it severely damaged the next several generations of his family, which is another story in itself. Back to alliances, though. I just wanted to show you that the philosophy of God is independence. It's independence of nations, independence of churches. That way, look, it's, it's not that somebody's gonna go, not going to go wrong. It's not that a nation is going to not turn against the Lord. It's not that, but the point is, if some nation turns against the Lord, that's on them to deal with that with the Lord, and they don't need to be dragging all these other nations into that, and this is the problem. But we see from the Bible, and we also see from just history in general, that alliances, just like with Ahab's alliances, they promise peace, but they always bring war. And this is what you need to watch for. Look, they bring war, they prolong war, and they create greater wars. They create greater wars. I mean, we do not have to look past 100 years to see this happening. Look, alliances make small conflicts huge. They make what could be a small skirmish between two, and as a matter of fact, it almost always works this way, where it would normally have been a small skirmish between two small countries turns into worldwide war. Look at World War I. World War I was literally started over these two tiny little Serbia and Bulgaria. It was like most people, most Americans couldn't, they wouldn't have a chance on even finding those two countries on a map. Serbia and Bulgaria have a, a conflict. And you think, what's the big deal? Well, the problem is, is that you have these alliances of big nations sitting outside of these little countries. And look, I'm not going to get into that. We don't need to get into the politics of World War I here, but this is, you can't argue that this is what happened. Basically, you had Serbia that was friends with France, Britain, and, and Russia, basically. And, you know, then you had, you know, Bulgaria that was friends with the Ottoman Empire, Germany, Austria, I think Italy was in there somewhere. And these big countries, they start fighting wars through these little countries. I mean, is this, you're like, this sounds familiar. Because it, it, it's the same thing every time. It's the same pattern every time. So they basically end up, you, you know, the big alliances ended up, end up using the small countries as cannon fodder to fight each other. And then the whole thing blows up and we have World War I, right? 
I mean, the same thing happened. Out of World War I, we had the League of Nations formed. And this was going to solve everything. This was the end of all wars, was the League of Nations. Well, the League of Nations had incited the Treaty of Versailles, which, you know, another entangling alliance and basically alienated just as many people as it brought together for peace, World War II. There you go. Now today, what do we have today? Alliances, again, we have today. We have NATO today. This is the big one today. NATO, I mean, you say, oh, it's, it's, for, it's for peace. NATO is causing and prolonging war. You can't argue that. Everyone's going to hear this and be like, oh, you love Russia. That's stupid. They're, like, there may not be any good guys, folks. These alliances, they, they bring war, which is why God was against it. And then, you know, the alliances will claim, they, but why do they claim alliances? For peace. For peace. Again, using, small, using smaller nations to do their bidding. Can we see the pattern? Can we see the pattern? Turn to Daniel chapter 9. So that begs the question. We see this pattern with alliances. Alliances form. This is nothing new under the sun. They, they, form, they form under the, the, uh, the, the preface of peace. We need to have this alliance for peace. They cause war. They prolong war. They make war bigger. They make war worse. So you say, how, let's get back to the Antichrist here. You say, how is the Antichrist going to accomplish what he accomplishes in Revelation chapter 13? The Bible says in Revelation 13, 7, that he's over all kindreds, all nations, and all tongues. How is he going to achieve that? Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27. Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27 is it's talking about Daniel's 70th week. Now, Daniel's 70th week, this is a kind of a complicated topic, but it's basically the, the seven-year rule of the Antichrist, okay? This, that's the 70th week of Daniel. But look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27. Now that you know the pattern of alliances that we looked at from the Bible, that we looked at from what's happened in recent history, look at how the Antichrist is going to get himself to Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 7. The Bible says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Let's read the rest of the verse. But that's the main point I want to make right there. And in the midst of the week, this is the middle of the week, three and a half years in, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This is the abomination of desolation, where he, he, uh, he, he, abomin he, he, has an abo he declares himself to be God in the temple of God. This is three and a half years into his seven-year reign. But what, and then we'll, we'll cover that on the Sermon on the Antichrist. But what I really want to focus on is the first phrase in this verse. It says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. You know what he does? He strikes a peace deal with all these nations. Many. Not all. Many. It, and it's important to note, it says many, not all. So he confirms. He makes. What does he do? He makes an alliance with many nations. He makes an alliance. Now, look, that will be a milestone when that happens, okay? But for the beginning of the covenant, he's going to go, and I can guarantee you he's going to promise peace. He's going to promise prosperity. He's going to promise all of these good things just like every other alliance promises. Now go to Revelation chapter 6. What is he actually going to do after he confirms this covenant with many. It's also, you, you must remember that he makes the covenant with many, not everybody though. So what happens? What needs to happen? What about the people that didn't get on board? This is Revelation chapter 6. This is Revelation chapter 6, discusses what happens to the people and how he goes from many. Revelation chapter 6, if you're taking notes, write this down. Revelation chapter 6 is how Daniel chapter 27, Chapter 9, 27 turns many to all. That's how he gets everybody else on board. You say, what does he do? He's a great political leader. He convinces them. Well, no. Look at what he does. Look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 1. So basically, if, you, if you're going to draw a timeline, you're going to go Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27, many. That's a deal with many, an alliance with many. Then you look at Revelation chapter 6 equals Revelation chapter 13, all. That's how he gets there. Okay? He gets there how? 
Let's, let's read it. Let's read it together. Look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 1. Maybe he just gives them a bunch of money. Look what he does. Revelation chapter 6. He says, And when I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals, so there's seven seals. Okay, we, we, we hear this in Revelation chapter 5. But here we are, we're opening the seals. I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the first seal is a massive war. This is a massive war. This is how this Antichrist that confirmed this covenant with many is going to get to all. Look at verse number 3. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat on there to take peace from the earth. Now we hear um, that it's not just any war. It's not just any war. It's a worldwide war. Because it took peace from where? It didn't take peace from, you know, uh, Asia. It didn't take peace from, you know, the, the Middle East. It didn't take peace from Judah. It took peace from the earth. So here we see we have a worldwide war. Look at what it says. It says that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So you're like, whoa, so much for peace, so much for a covenant, but guess what? We got to get from many to all. We got to get to all in order to get to Revelation chapter 13. Remember, at the end of Revelation chapter 13, everyone except the saints is on board. This is how we get there. In Revelation chapter 6, this world wide war. So how do we get how do we get to the end of Revelation chapter 13 from where we are today? Basically, nationalism has to die. Nationalism has to go away. Now, will the nationalism of today, just think in your mind of the most national the most nationalism minded countries you can think of. Will the nationalism of today, now here's what we speculate. Will the nationalism that exists in the world today be destroyed through this war in Revelation chapter 6? Or will it take a world war to get to the point of the covenant with many? I, that I, I, can't, I can't tell you. But I can tell you that as of today, what I'm comfortable preaching is that the alliance, as with all others, will begin with a promise of peace. Because that's how every alliance begins. That's how every alliance sounds good. It will begin with a promise of peace, but it will bring war. That's what you need to understand. This is what you, as a Bible-believing Christian, can see that nobody else will see. You see how the, the saints are going to know when this guy is like, oh, yeah, we're all coming together and all this, and, and like many are on board, but most are, you know, most or some are not. You, we will know what's coming. We will know that there is worldwide war that is coming. I also know that, I mean, just looking at the world today, and I don't know if the end times are going to be in our lifetime or not. I, you know, I hope not. I mean, I hope we have more time to get more people saved. But I also know if I look at the world today and if this is happening in our lifetime, I know that if you just think of the major nationalist world powers today, Russia and China, I know that they're not just going to give up their sovereignty anytime soon, you know, without some major coercion. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I mean, we all know that. But here's another part. Turn, to Revel turn back to, or I'll just read it for you. But here's another part of globalism that I want to bring up. So we see the alliances. We see the alliances on the promises, what they lead to. We see that in order for these alliances, um, for people that they would have to give up their nationalism to be part of this, and it's probably going to take a major world war, which Revelation chapter 6 makes perfect sense to accomplish that. But in Revelation chapter 13, there's more to this idea of globalism. In Revelation 13, 16, I'll just read it for you again, talking about the mark of the beast. The Bible says he causeth, causeth all, again all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had that mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You know what that is? He has all the world under control, and then he creates this rule that you must do this, and you must worship this image, you must worship me as God, or you can't buy or sell. You know what this is? We see this today. This is economic sanctions. That's, that's what he's doing. 
That's what he's doing. He, he is literally, look, economic sanctions are used today. They are used on, the, on a worldwide system today. This is a real thing. Here's another thing. Economic sanctions are lies just as well as alliances are, are lies in the, in the sense that economic sanctions are sold to the public as you know, a deterrent, as a deterrent to war, as a deterrent to destruction, when they've never deterred one person ever, as far as I know. Instead, instead they're not a deterrent. You know what they are? Just like what the Bible says, they are punishment. They are punishment for not complying. What you are seeing in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 16 and verse number 17 is economic punishment for not complying. That's exactly what economic sanctions are. Many of you are not old enough to remember this, but in the mid-90s, in the mid-90s, we had economic sanctions against a country called Iraq. Before the war in 2003, we sanctioned this country for probably more than 10 years, I think. We had economic sanctions, like, like crushing economic sanctions. Look, it deterred nothing, because it turns out there was nothing to deter. But it deterred nothing. All it did was punish them. And, and look, what it does is it punishes the poor. It punishes the weak. It punishes, like, there was a, there was a 60 Minutes interview. There was a 60 Minutes interview where the Secretary of State was interviewed in, like, 1996 or 1997. And it was like Leslie Stahl or some liberal reporter was, was asking this, this Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who is, you know, she, this is a very wicked person. Very wicked person. She asked her straight up, she said, we've heard that over 500,000 Iraqi children have died from these economic sanctions. Do you think that that price is worth it? We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. 500,000 children dead. And look, it deterred nothing. It was punishment. It was punishment. Exactly how the Antichrist is going to punish the saints. Through what? Through economic sanctions. So there needs to be a system that now you wonder why everyone, you know, all these nationalist countries don't necessarily want to jump on board all these globalist systems where their, their finance can just be completely shut off. <laughs> why would they do that? With knowing the history of what these economic sanctions are, what they have done, like, nobody would want to get on board with this. It's going to take a war, is what I'm going to try to, trying to get you to understand. It's going to take a war for the people, the nations who just have national self-interest. That's what Revelation chapter 6 is all about. It is crushing the national self-interest of the people that wouldn't get on board to make many into all. All right? Look, I mean, you say, what about the U.S.? Are we globalist? Well, yes, we are. You know, we're, we're, we're globalist. The United States is globalist as long as we're ahead of the alliance. <laughs> that's, that's kind of where the United States is going. If, if you, in the United States, this is also why, this is also why nationalist, just the term nationalist is, is a bad word. If you hear anybody, you know, saying that the, a certain politician is nationalist, you know, this is why they attack Trump so much. Not to defend or, you know, deny Trump, but this way, because he was a nationalist. He was like, we need to get back to our own self-interest. And if you, are, if you say that you're a nationalist or stand up for nationalist ideals, you'll be called things like a Nazi, like a racist. Just, this is why. Because there is, there is a definite principalities and powers at work today to get rid of nationalism and push towards this globalism that will make Revelation 13 and Revelation chapter 6 a possibility. So this is the clues that we need to be looking at. I mean, just think about, you know, Russia and China. They're not going to give in to this, not without a fight. They see the pattern. You know, they may, be, they may not be godly, but they're not, they're not dumb. They see what's happening. They see what's happening. Alliances equal war, and a global economic system equals the ability to punish. Those are the two points about this clue.
All right? It's going to take, now go back to Revelation chapter 6. Now here's, what's, here, here's another interesting thing. This is a little depressing. But go, go to Revelation uh, chapter 6. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 together and look at one more thing. So look, it's going to take, it's going to take to get the many, to get the many to all, it's going to take a major war. But Revelation chapter 6 kind of tells us how major the war is going to be as well. Look at Revelation chapter 6 and look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Now this is, this is super interesting here. The, the Bible is saying here that the, the third seal was famine, basically. The third seal up one verse uh, earlier was famine. And then in verse number six, or verse number seven and verse number eight, we have just death. It doesn't say war. It says death from the sword, from famine, and from beasts of the earth. Now here's what's super interesting. Here's what's super interesting. There, the only thing, the only, the only type of war or type of conflict that could be, that has been estimated, look, we're talking a fourth of the earth, that's two billion people. If you look at uh, the population of the earth is 7.9 billion people, roughly a fourth of that's about two billion people. So if you look at two billion people, we're talking about, you know, they've done estimates on just all out nuclear war, and it's right around that two billion people that, that they think would die. And guess what? Here's what's really interesting. Not that, not that this is interesting. This is horrible to think about this. But what's really interesting is that it's not the nuclear war that would all these studies and all these models that they've done. Yes, the nuclear war would kill hundreds of millions of people. You know, all, I'm talking all out nuclear war between major nuclear powers. It would kill, you know, hundreds of millions of people, but would kill the vast majority of people, and this is even secular studies have done this, is the famine and starvation that comes after. They have estimated that even a small nuclear conflict would cause massive worldwide starvation. These are secular studies that, that say this. So it's, it's, not the, it's not the bombs. But the point is, this is a very, you know, real thing. That, you know, is the technology exists today. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying the technology exists today for this to come to pass. All right, so look, the clues, we should be paying attention to these clues. We should be paying attention to these things. Alliances, bad. You know, worldwide economic system, bad. It will be that, why? Because it will be, God is a, na God wants nations to be nations, churches to be churches, individuals to not be yoked up, saints not to be yoked up with unbelievers. Look, it will be the same tool that is used by the Antichrist. All right? Promising peace, promising this covenant, so we're not to make covenants. Look, this is why Baptists, by the way, this is why Baptists have never wanted anything to do with any government. You know, just a side note. Baptists have, have historically not wanted anything to do with any government. As a matter of fact, at the foundation of our country in the late 1700s, this is a, 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 a great story to, to research and look up, but it was actually the Baptists that got involved because, you know, the plan, the plan by Patrick Henry actually was kind of the pusher uh, or the, the champion behind this plan, the plan was to have the, the country be, have five denominations, have five Christian denominations that were kind of sponsored by the government. This was the plan. And the Baptists, and they even came to the Baptists, you know, James Madison was kind of, he was kind of uh, tasked with going to the Baptists to get them on board with this plan. So you would pay your taxes and you could write down which denomination you wanted your taxes to go for, and the Baptists are like, we're out, man. And James Madison and the, some of the other founders were like, hey, man, you guys have been persecuted for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. You finally have a seat at the table. They're like, see you later. Have a nice day. Baptists were persecuted in early America before the Revolutionary War. Baptists in Virginia were, were thrown in prison, thrown in jail for preaching. They were persecuted here. As a matter of fact, it was them convincing James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, who's in no, no definition of the term, a was also against these 
thrown in prison. They thought that there should be religious freedom. So the Baptists actually influenced James Madison, who influenced George Washington and others, to create what we know as the First Amendment today, where there is no state-sponsored denomination. Instead, in 1785, Madison argued that pure Christianity would flourish without state support as it had during the time of Christ. And he got that from the Baptists. So look, you can thank the Baptists for your First Amendment today. A lot of people don't know that story. But the Baptists have always been independent. Christians have always been independent. Nations are supposed to be independent. Churches are supposed to be independent. Look, the First Amendment is, is possibly one of the last good things about this country. The fact that we can still walk up and down the streets, some streets as we found out today, and still preach the gospel, look, I guess I'll just cling to that one for now. But that's, that's a beautiful thing about this country. So back to the sermon. Back to the sermon. The methodology is this. We see the end product in the Bible. We see the Antichrist. We see the one world government. We see the one world economic system. And then we see where we are today. We should notice these patterns emerging. We should notice these things. We should notice these alliances emerging. We should notice these, um, this pattern of economic punishment emerging because these are the patterns that will be used by the Antichrist. So just recognize. What does the Bible say? Watch. Watch. And look, we're prudent. You know, plan accordingly. You know, plan accordingly. I mean, I've, I, I'm not digging a bunker in my backyard, okay? I'm going to keep coming to church no matter what's going on. I've already made that decision. I'm going to keep going soul winning no matter what's going on. But look, you know, plan accordingly. Don't have like a, a day and a half of food in your house. I mean, be prepared. I mean, famine was one of the problems here. Okay, people were dying from famine. You should be prepared. You should know how to do some things. You should have some food on hand. This isn't a, a doomsday prepper um, sermon, but the point is those are good things to do to um, take care of and protect for your family. Because, uh, you know, we have this knowledge that other people don't have. So, the one world government, yes, it's coming. A lot of things have to happen to get to that point, but we know what those things are. So, let's watch for these globalism clues. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.